Hello. Uh, yes, my name is Marco Volk, and uh, today what we're going to do is we're going to do a, uh, a class, probably about an hour long, on residential moisture intrusion and building science. So, uh, some of the goals that we're going to try to achieve today, we're going to become a little more, more knowledgeable of the various methods of moisture intrusion and diffusion into homes. We're going to accomplish these goals by some objectives. Basically, we're going to look at various methods of moisture intrusion. We're going to define building science, give you some examples. And of course, we'll try to provide some case studies as we go through this. So why building science? <clears throat> well, basically, houses are all different. They do not have the same rain exposure. They do not have the same solar exposure. You know, some houses may be facing the, the south and west, and you get a lot more wind-driven rains there. Um, some houses will have different moisture absorption rate, depending on whether it's a brick home, a stucco home, um, it could be a steel metal home. The R values are going to be different. <clears throat> some older houses don't even have insulation, and some newer houses are super insulated. And, of course, the drying potential is going to be completely different uh, with different types of homes and size of homes so simply put homes are not the same there's no two houses that are the same and if you look at this this picture here you'll see two houses that actually look the same um, and they're not the same and the reason they're not the same is because the lower picture is the dog house um, building science we're going to try to explain building science so basically building science is the interaction between various materials products systems designs and the people who occupy the home so maybe we'll just give you an example on what building science is we're going to call this mr frugal uh, basically um, this is a client that had called us he had been divorced twice he was broke and he was trying to save money so what he did was uh, he bought a few ventless gas logs and he thought you know I'll put these gas logs into my two fireplaces and I'll seal up the chimneys. This way I'll get all the heat from the gas logs. And they look like they're old gas logs. Um, maybe he bought them from Craigslist or something. Then he went into the bedrooms and he said, you know, I'm not using these rooms, so maybe I'll just cover up all the supply ducts. You know, I'll set my furnace really low and I won't heat these rooms. And uh, so he sealed them up because he wasn't using the rooms. He was in the home by himself. He was trying to sell it. And if you look at the one picture on your far right, you'll notice some staining. And we'll get to that in a second. If you look at the staining, what he did was he had some problems after he did these changes to his home. This is the north side of the home. And the north side of the home generally is colder. You know, it could be several degrees colder. And so if a dew point temperature occurs, it's going to happen on the north side. Well, he probably had that happening because he had some blue paint and he had to repaint the wall. And so he was getting dew point condensation. And also, <clears throat> the water may have been running underneath the carpet. Now, some people might think this is an open window. And yeah, open windows can do that. Uh, but he also had uh, red paint uh, he had stored in the closet. And that was for his... Uh, living room i'm sorry his his bedroom and if you look at the upper portion where there's water running down that's a pretty cold spot also and sometimes that could be associated with ice dams but it can also be associated with dew point condensation it was a little bit colder because i tested it and uh if you have a lot of humidity in a home you can get dew point condensation occurring so it was getting wet and he you know he thought he'd paint that another thing was when we looked through the whole house all the north windows had mildew and he tried to clean it off but you it's hard to clean this stuff because it's in the nicks and crannies and if you see a lot of mildew on the bottoms of the windows uh, you can almost uh, assume that the house has a moisture event or high indoor humidity and so that this this home had high humidity and high moisture um, he also decided since it, the house was so unbalanced because what he's done he brought a couple little heaters in and where he was spending his time he would just plug in the heater when he needed it so he was running electricity and so basically his solution was to call a roofer and a mold man basically what was happening in this home was the two ventless heaters produced so much humidity in the house because ventless heaters do produce water vapor and carbon dioxide 
both of which you don't want in your house. And by just running these two units continuously as heat sources, he created high indoor humidity. And then by closing off the heat ducts in the bedrooms on the north side, he created dew point condensation, so his walls started getting wet. And basically, uh, we told them that you can't change the anatomy of the house that way. Well, that would be building science. We talked a little about that. Now, modern homes and additions and renovations are all different than they used to be in the past. And so, you know, they're all different because thermal insulation is different. Uh, you've got tighter construction. Newer homes are getting a lot tighter. Uh, they're built using all types of new products. You have different chimneys too. You have active chimneys versus power vented. In the old days in Lakewood, you know, the chimneys were, dra were uh, on gravity. Uh, I'm sorry, the HVAC units are gravity. And so there was no vents connected to them. And then, you know, in the 80s and 90s, they, uh, they went to, from gravity furnaces, they went to uh, 80 plus, which were draft induced. In other words, there's a fan blowing up and they hooked those up to the chimneys. And then today, the newer furnaces actually don't even use the chimneys. They block off the chimneys. You, got, you see those white pipes, those PVC pipes coming out the sides of homes. Those are condensing furnaces. And the only difference, you know, just so you know, the difference between a, a, a non-efficient furnace and a high efficient furnace is the stack temperature. The old furnaces, ran up to four or five hundred degrees up the chimneys going up you know through the roof where the new the new furnaces have low stack temperatures some like 80 90 up to 120 degrees and so that's what makes them more efficient um, in the old days the homes were made of brick and stone you can see in the 1600s they used to make mud mud homes and they would hold a lot of moisture you know and then once it got wet they would dry and then of course they went to the old board lumber you know, in the old days, 17, 18 hunters, they cut down 100-year-old trees and, and, and they used those and they would hold some moisture when it rained and they would dry. And then, of course, it, later on in the 1800s, we started making brick homes and they would hold a lot of moisture. And, of course, they would dry. And then today, homes are made out of products that do not hold much moisture. And if you look at the one home on the bottom, it's glass, steel, and asphalt. So older materials, we call this moisture storage capacity. Older materials have higher moisture storage capacity. And this would be typically masonry, block, plaster, brick, wood, slate, tile. And newer products today maybe would have less moisture capacity like eaves, plastic wood, hardy board, masonite, steel studs, vinyl, plastic, rubber roofs, etc. And so basically the new houses just don't hold as much moisture. And I was in a class about 15, 20 years ago, building science class, and somebody actually calculated this out and came up with a 2,000 square foot building. If it was built in the 1900s, it would hold approximately 500 gallons. Then in the 1930s, you know, we went to wood frame, and that would only hold like 50 gallons, a lot less uh, with the wood frame and the plaster board. And then in 2001, there's a home that has vinyl siding, it has plastic vinyl windows, there's no wood, steel studs, uh, and then of course drywall, um, and, and of course the floors were, were um, vinyl and carpet, and this basically would only hold five gallons. So the moisture st storage capacity of homes is significantly diminished, and this is why we have mold, uh, because there's, less, there's more, uh, less moisture in a home. Um, so basically, modern buildings are much harder to dry they they you know we already mentioned earlier but they absorb water differently they stay wet longer so the mold can grow and they don't tolerate a whole lot of moisture as they did in the past so you end up getting poor indoor air quality problems you end up getting mold and of course deterioration and another another uh, condition is that the more the process the material the less tolerant it is to moisture so in the 1900s we had 100 year old trees were board lumber and, and and some of these trees you could see this type of wood has a hard time growing mold on it then of course we came up with plywood and we always see mold on plywood and then we started using uh, gypsum board with with uh, uh, paper backing uh, which is basically paper, and mold loves that. And when that gets wet, that pretty much just grows mold. And then we used OSB because we started grinding up the plywood. And when OSB gets wet, yes, it, it can 
uh, grow a lot of mold. And, and if you remember the 80s where we had all those kit garages, and a lot of these Lakewood homes, the garages uh, were, were deteriorating because of the flat roofs. And then in the 60s, they didn't fit the cars because the cars got bigger and they made those kickouts and they fell apart and rotted. So some people would buy these kit garages and you see them all over 80s and 90s. But they use this material on the outside, which is a composite type wood. Uh, companies like Louisiana Pacific and several others manufactured it. A lot of those are all deteriorating. And then even today, the hardboard and particle board uh, types of products are also deteriorating. Some of the hardboard uh, is a problem if it's not back prime. So you, when you buy these new products, you also have to uh, follow all the recommendations from the manufacturer. We're gonna talk about a few basic rules of building sites. One, gravity is always down. Moisture flow is from warm areas to cold areas. Moisture flow is from more to less. Heat flow is from warm to cold. Air flow is from high pressure to low pressure. A few more rules. Moist air rises because it's lighter than dry air. And a lot of people have a hard time with that, but that's why we have clouds and that's why it rains because the moist air evaporates. It's heavier, and it, or, I'm sorry, it's lighter and it evaporates. And so moist air rises. Um, it was a great example. People don't think about it, but moisture can rise in your house as well. Um, a lot of homes have sub pumps and sub pumps could be installed for waterproofing systems, interior, exterior. They could be installed for bathrooms in the basements. They could be installed out in the country where, where you're trying to bring water uh, back to the city and, and, the, and the sanitary storm lines are too high and the basement's too low, so you gotta pump it up. Um, so there's a lot of reasons for sub pumps, but the bottom line is sub pumps, they hold water. And a lot of sub pumps have a lot of pipes connected to the exterior or interior drain tile systems. And if that's the case, they're generally perforated and there's water and high humidity. So if your sub pump isn't covered, you're getting a lot of moisture rising up in your basement. So your sub pump actually becomes a moisture generator in your home. And these waterproofing people just don't get it. They put these plastic covers on and they got these holes in them. And now they, now they just created moisture in the house. They put a hole in the ground, put in a pipe full of uh, holes and now now moisture is rising up. And, and uh, in this next scene, you'll picture, you'll actually see, I'm using a smoke tube. And you can see how the the air is just getting sucked out of the interior drain tile system and this one is actually assisted a little assisted with a, a the furnace was on and we'll talk a little, little bit about negative pressure here coming up real soon but uh, it's like it just sucks the moisture right out and if you put a humidity gauge on it you'll see that the temperature is 66 degrees and the humidity is 80. well that could be a problem uh, simply a sub pump that isn't sealed uh, can cause condensation in windows, it can rot windows, it can cause condensation on the attic. And so you really want a, uh, the, the sub pump to be sealed 100%. And you could even buy or have one of these radon companies come in and they'll put a radon cover on these. Now, if you have a very active sub pump, that's a whole nother problem. You, you probably want to consider a, installing a, a water backup or a battery backup. So we'll talk a little bit about common methods of moisture entry. Uh, one is gravity, you know, rain, snow, hail, momentum, wind-driven rain, surface tension, absorption, air movements, air pressure, vapor pressure, capillary action, suction above and below, and vapor diffusion. So gravity, there's a typical slide. This is, we talked a little bit, mentioned that southern exposure homes get a lot more wind-driven rain. So if you have a brick home, it's going to suck water because the mortar joints are very absorbent, so is the brick. Now, if the brick is cracked, and what happens in brick homes, you have these lintels above the windows, and they rust, and when they rust, they expand, and they cause cracks. You know, some people call these lintel cracks, but anyways, water will get right into that crack and run around the window, and the thermal image, you can see the colder rainwater is kind of getting absorbed in the brick uh, through the crack, and that can lead to moisture intrusion. Surface tension, that's another way water gets in the homes, and this is kind of a weird example, but it's surface tension. Uh, this was a development that had many buildings, and the sewer lines uh, from the upper floors going to the lower floors went through this wall, and they're all built the same, and so when the, when the um, closet people came in to install the closet shelving, they pretty much put a screw into every uh, single, sanitary line that went through the floor or that went through the wall and what happened then was sometimes 
as water was flushed from the upper floors, it would hit that screw and that water would get surface tension, it would follow that screw through the hole and go into the wall. And this particular, this unit here actually uh, uh, had mold in it because it was vacant for a while. Um, and it was cold and colder homes that aren't conditioned uh, or aren't dehumidified will tend to have more mildew and mold. But it was a problem, all the units, uh, all the closets had to, been, had to be opened up and they had to move the shelves and change things and replace all the pipes. And th this is a three-year-old condo. And the best part of this one was um, that, uh, this is just another picture uh, that shows you the pipe after we broke the wall open to show you the stack coming down from the upper floor and there's uh, two screws that went into it. And what happens is when they build new units, they have to pressure test the sanitary line, so they cap them. Well, you know, when you're done testing it, you probably should move the caps. So now, not only did this one, this one had a lot more mold, it was capped. So now you had pressure built in this sanitary line, because generally these are opened up so you don't have any pressure, right? So now if you got pressure, you're actually pushing water through the screw, the, the screw um, uh, penetration. Now we also have absorption. A lot of products absorb, more, uh, absorb water. And here's a great example of just old brick, you know, 80 year old brick and they're not taking care of it. And as the mortar joints deteriorate, they're gonna suck in a lot of water. And once the water gets sucked into the brick, it's gonna leak behind the brick. Now you're hoping that the brick drainage space and drainage plane from the initial installation is gonna work. If not, you're gonna get leaks. You can even have absorption through new products this is some new stuff and I, I see i even see it in lakewood people put on little additions and they redo the back porches and they put the stone on there and there's nothing wrong with the stone it's a great product but you need to put a drainage plane and a drainage space on the back side and probably in ohio for the first 10 years of this this type of product installation they didn't do that and so now you're going to see a lot of homes that have this product you're going to you're going to see scaffolding in front of these homes because they're going to be tearing it down uh, a lot of these builders actually most of them did not install the proper rain screens on the back side and i get these calls all the time these are very expensive homes um and here i am showing you a two and a half gallon bucket of water i'm dumping it on the culture stone very slowly and if you look at the thermal imaging after I dump the two gallons of water you can see where it went none of it went to the ground it all got sucked in and there's your window the hole it's all full of water now with that water just sitting there and and it's supposed to drain and this particular house it wasn't draining the, the they were complaining about musty mold odors in the home so in the garage this is the garage area I had cut a hole in the wall and I, and after like about 10 minutes of this water was dripping through the staples inside the wall and uh, it's a problem and uh, here's another home we looked at and actually we did we had to tear it all off and you can see some of the mildew on the sheeting and they just nailed it right up to the sheeting where this is what they should have had they should have had the Tyvek and then that green if you look at that green board that is what is called a rain screen there's a lot of products that make them and basically if you think of look at a cardboard box you'll see how it's corrugated well it's kind of the same thing there's a space in there so any water gets in inside this it can run down and then you drain it through weep holes or whatever means you have on the outside another uh, moisture entry problem in homes is brick that does not have weep holes and most brick in lakewood and older homes in ohio do not have weep holes now it doesn't leak all the time, but it does leak 10, 15% of the time. It's gonna cause problems. It may not cause flooding or anything like that, but it may cause odors. It may cause deterioration interstitially inside the walls. It may cause deterioration to the band joist. And basically, if you look at this, this cutout and this sketch is showing you that the brick sits on the foundation and there's little holes for water to drain. On the backside, there's a three inch gap. We call it a capillary break so water can run behind a brick when a brick gets saturated. And then of course you have some type of waterproofing, uh, damp proofing membrane on the back. And this is what you'll see. You'll see like holes, you'll see slits, you'll see ropes. And sometimes, you know, they'll even use Tyvek. And this way any rain gets behind there on the bottom, it's able to get out. And you'll also see this underneath windows. If you don't have it, then sometimes you will it'll drain, and in this particular case, masonry block is hollow, so it'll drain through the block down. You can see the efflorescence. Um, 
you will also find it in the band joists if you remove the insulation, on, especially on walls facing the west and south. Um, you can see deterioration uh, and moisture stains in the band joist pockets. And a lot of people, you know, they have carpenter ants and they're trying to figure out where they come where they're coming from well carpenter ants like moist wood so if you've got carpenter ants and every year they keep coming back you better find out what's leaking where it's leaking and there's something leaking somewhere it could be underneath the window underneath the door it could be in a wall uh, whatever uh, and carpenter ants will have satellite colonies so you know you may have a big colony outside in some big stump that you left after you cut the tree down or after wind blew it down and then you'll have smaller uh, colonies in, in, indoors now, this is what we call a weed pole leak repair. Uh, this was a NASA engineer, uh, and he figured, well, you know, I don't have weed poles, so why don't I just make a little gutter system? And it was above the drop ceiling, so, you know, you'd never see this. Um, and then once the pan filled up, it would evaporate, and nobody would know about it. I'm joking. This is not a repair. Uh, it's not a proper way of repairing a weed pole. And actually, installing weed poles later is very difficult. Um, now... Brick also absorbs water, and if you don't have the proper drainage space and drainage plane, now some people, you know, when they put brick up, they push the mortar behind there in that little gap. Yeah, that, that's not really a problem because that still drains down as long as you have weep holes. Uh, but if you have a poor drainage plane, in other words, a tar paper is done wrong or it's cut or that wasn't lapped properly and the water's running down and, 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 and you know, they, they lapped it wrong or it was damaged during construction, it's going to leak. And we see a lot of this, even brand new homes. This, this house is only 10 years old and it took this long for this brick to leak in and it leaks in through the mortar joints and it totally rotted out the whole front of the house and it rotted out down in the basement band joist and the whole house stunk. All right, we're going to talk a little bit about differential air pressure and return duct leakage. Now, you know, pre different pressures in homes can cause problems. Now, we're today, we don't have a lot of time, so we're just going to turn about, we're just going to talk a little bit about the return duct leakage. Now, if you have a, a boiler, you probably don't need to worry about this problem, but if you have a, a forced air system in the basement, you have supply ducts that heat. That's the hot air that comes out of, out of registers that makes you feel warm. And you have the other ones that don't do much. Well, those are return ducts, and they suck, and they suck the air back down to the furnace. Well, in the basement, you have these ducts, and they could also be in crawl spaces uh, and in areas that aren't heated or cool. But you want these cold air returns to be 100% sealed. You, want, you, you don't want them to have little holes in them. Uh, because they start sucking and if you look these are pictures at the uh, in the basement you'll see there's a little smoke tubes and that little hole that I'm using a smoke tube on well you've got a thousand of those they end up to a lot of holes and a lot of times where you connect the furnace plenums where you have the filters and a lot of filters don't have covers on them. a lot of times you have holes in in the returns and a lot of times you have you actually have registers in the basements with the returns. Now, in bigger homes that are completely finished in the basement, you probably need to have some cold air returns, but that's a whole nother ball game. That whole system needs to be balanced properly. So we're gonna go to the smaller basement here. And here you can see how these holes are all sucking the basement. Well, when you close that door upstairs, your basement sucks, then guess what? You create a differential pressure and it, it blows upstairs. Okay, so and that could push air up into your attic. A couple of ways you could see if your basement sucks, you can either use smoke tubes, you can hire those people that come with those blower doors, infiltrometer test, they, um, those are the, the um, some of these uh, um, utility companies provide these services, you gotta pay a little bit for them. You gotta be careful, a lot of these guys will come out and charge you 50 bucks to do a blower door test or infil infiltrometer test, and now then they're gonna wanna sell you like you know, a new furnace or a new window. So you want to be really careful with that. Um, so you can actually close a door, sit at the top of steps, wet your hand, and turn on your furnace and see if you could feel it air blowing into the down the basement steps. You can use toilet paper, smoke. That means your basement is negative. And when your basement sucks, that means your cold air returns are probably leaking. You don't want that because now you're going to be sucking in non-conditioned air from other parts of the house in the basement. And we'll probably talk a little bit more about that. Well, if your basement sucks, then your upstairs blows, right? And so these are, this is, uh, the old can lights are like holes uh, in the ceiling. So now you're blowing hot conditioner into the attic. And a lot of homes that have um, 
attic access panels. The panels are sealed, they're not insulated, they're not weather stripped. And so if you've got positive pressure, you don't need a big gap for hot air to go through your closet ceiling. A lot, of, a lot of these are located in closet ceilings. You want to seal, insulate, and weather strip this. Other ones could simply be there's uh, uh, some of these older homes have built in um, shelving and when you pull out those shelves you can see your attic that's not going to work that's a that we call this a thermal bypass thermal bypass meaning hot air goes into a non-conditioned space some people have attic fans uh you know those whole house fans that are in the hallways coincidentally if you do use those and you like those make sure you open windows up on the first floor because if not you're going to create a huge negative pressure problem you could call your water you can cause your water heater you know to spill you can cause fires you can cause dirt to come down your chimneys and dust up your whole house so if you have these make sure that uh, you open windows when you're using them but in the winter time hot air is going right up through these there's no insulation there um, also, people that have finished third floors or stairwells to the third lake, which is full of these third floors where the stairs go up. And what happens is it's a door to your storage space upstairs. And you got to remember when they built these homes, it was a gravity home. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't as efficient. There wasn't any insulation. And so now, and a lot of Lakewood homes don't even have cold air returns on the second floor. It's rare that you have them, especially in these homes that are built 1900s and 1930s. So you almost have to keep all your doors open upstairs just to get the air back down to the basement or to the first floor. Well, the upstairs is pressurized. Let's assume there's no cold air returns. And generally, there aren't a whole lot of them in Lakewood in these older homes. So now you're going to blow air through that door going upstairs in the attic. And now you're going to have heat loss and when you lose that heat the basement furnace says oh no where do, where this air goes so now it creates more negative pressure it's got to get more air from somewhere and it's not gonna it's gonna be air a lot of this air is gonna be it has to be air from the outside which means you have to condition it heat it cool it, and dehumidify it and that costs you a lot of money so these doors in the attic you want to insulate seal the weather strip and then some people that have boilers decide to put furnaces in the third unheated areas a lot of Lakewood homes have that's a whole other set of problems and you want to make sure that on those that the supply ducts are sealed and the return ducts are sealed. And you want to make sure they're all insulated. And you might even have to build a little box or a little room for the HVAC unit. Other ways a thermal bypass occurs, this particular uh, home, the guy, I don't know what book he was reading, but this guy actually just put a hole uh, through his um, second floor ceiling to the attic. And he thought, well, this will work pretty good. It's not because now you just have this hole blowing air right up in your attic, and you you know you probably don't have any snow on your on your roof when you drive by. I like to drive by in the winter and see who's got snow on their roofs and who doesn't. You can always see the the uneven melt patterns. You can see where the attic access panels are. You can see where there's thermal bypass and thermal bridging conditions. And of course, you know if you have ducts in the attic, and you know duct tape is good for everything but ducts so you can see what's happening here this guy's just heating this whole attic now non-duct tape thermal bridging repairs uh, are a little bit better they do sell products if you fly a lot i believe sky mall sells these zipper uh, pull down stair and attic fan and attic access panel uh, they're basically cloth and you install them up in the attic and you just unzip them and you can get up in there some people build them some people make them uh, you i think you could buy these and then if you look at the top picture that's actually an attic whole house fan with a mechanical um insulated damper which is kind of cool i don't see a lot of those i bet that's expensive and that just kind of opens up when the fan turns on and closes when the fan's off. This way you don't lose any energy. And then the one on below is just a box. People like to make boxes, and they'll insulate them, and they put them on hinges. They just flip them over. Um, well, some effects of differential air pressure. Um, negative basement pressure, we talked about, means higher pressure in the upper floors. It also will create ice dams. We're going to talk about that in a minute. It's going to create heat loss. It, when you have negative pressure in your basement, you start having high radon. So just by having duct work in the basement that, that's leaking air, you can have radon levels. And if the basement sucks, then where's the air coming from? Well, guess what? It could even come from your, your electrical um, conduits. And if it's a hot, humid day, and you've got the air conditioner on, you've got negative pressure, you've got humid air going into the box, which is in the basement, on probably the north wall, which is colder, and now you've got condensation in your box, and your box is rusting. And your electrician tries to tell you it's a plumbing leak. It's not. And then you have corrosion, you have a fire, you get heated, uh, um, 
heated breakers. Um, you could also have incomplete combustion. So now you're going to suck air, you know, through your water heater, and someone's taking a shower, and and negative air is coming down the chimney, and also the water heater flue isn't working right because uh, that becomes the makeup air, and now the water heater has incomplete combustion, and you could create carbon monoxide. You could also it could come down a chimney, and you can cause sooting, and it could cause odor uh, if there's areas. Where, where you have cavities with moisture and you can bring up odor. And some of these new homes have stone odor because the stone, um, a lot of the west side stone homes built in the 2000 era during the high boom got stone from the dusky quarry and they hit this sulfur uh, um, vein and they, they, it stinks like sulfur. This is, a, this is a case study, ice dam. Basically they call us up, hey, water's leaking through my fan. And you show up and there's a fan and there's a bucket underneath, there's water dripping into it. Well, you're trying to figure, well, you know, how's, how does that happen? How does water get to that fan on the first floor? Well, up, you go outside and there's a little ice dam. And of course they have a heat loss because they had can lights. Can lights, the old can lights will also contribute to thermal bridging, thermal bypass, and heat loss to the unconditioned attic space. It melts the snow and it hits the gutters, ice forms. And once it hits the ice, the ice starts melting and then it backs up underneath the shingles. So you can see the stains. There's our can lights that actually cause the, ther the, the thermal bypass, thermal bridge, and the ice dam. You can see that little stain. I'm not sure that it comes out that well in the photo, but there's a little moisture stain there, and there's a tub right underneath it. So we take a thermal imaging camera, and we take a look at it, and you can actually see how the water is running down the studs uh, right at that cathedral ceiling to the top of the window. It runs down the side of the window. It runs down the wall underneath the tub, across the floor, into the first floor ceiling. There's our first floor ceiling. There's our fan. You can see the darker areas. That's cold water puddling up. And then the fan has a hole in it, right? Because you got to have electricity coming through. So that's why it drips through the fan. And, of course, you know, it it's going to keep leaking. And so we basically told our clients, hey, you know, maybe we got to add a little more softened ventilation. Uh, we need to improve the attic insulation. We need to add ice cables. Um, and the ice cables are always uh, a repair. It's kind of like a plan B. I would probably tell my clients also to get rid of the can lights and repair the thermal bypass condition and maybe put surface mountain lights or buy insulated can lights and what else do you think we told our clients get more buckets we're going to talk about another uh, moisture type entry with uh, the vehicle called vapor pressure high vapor pressure low vapor pressure well this is a case study uh, called the baby and um, this particular couple had a vaporizer or one of those moisture um, machines and in one bedroom and two bedrooms in their bedroom they had one in the living room they had one on the changing uh, a baby diaper changing uh, table then they even had other moisture generators they had plants they had one of those water cat things where the water keeps running um, they had a dog uh, they cooked a lot they just created a lot of moisture in this home and so high vapor pressure, what happens when you have high vapor pressure in a house, high humidity, you have more grains of moisture in the air. And so an area that has less grains of moisture, let's say the attic, well, high vapor pressure will travel to low vapor pressure. So in this particular case, the moist air would go into the cold attic area. Now it would also go in there through positive pressure, which we talked about, and through thermal bypass uh, conditions which we also talked about what happens then is once the moisture gets into the attic or unconditioned space and the, it's moist air it has a lot of grains of moisture um, and then it condensates on the sheathing the roof sheathing and usually on the north side first because the north side tends to be colder and once it condensates on the sheathing the sheathing gets wet and of course the sheathing will expand and cause roof problems uh, not to mention it will also uh, get absorbed into the wood and then you'll get mold growing on there people call it black mold generally it's cladosporium that grows up there and the wood becomes weak um, this home also we're going to call it a bonus because it also had condensation on the windows and so these windows had mold and mildew and a lot of times that that front door closet especially if it faces the north or the northeast corner sometimes it's a little bit colder in those corners you get mold growth in the corners or in the closets Another vehicle is called vapor diffusion. 
and that's where we diffuse and move moisture throughout a house. Um, if, let's say, for example, the brick becomes wet because it's facing the south and it rained for a few hours, and we talked about storage capacity, and let's say the brick got saturated, and so now the brick is completely wet, and let's say it had a weed pole and it's draining, it's gonna take a while for it to dry, now the sun comes out, and the sun heats up that brick that's wet, and it gets really hot behind the brick, and so it creates vapor, and so the vapor pressure wants to push through that wall, and so as it pushes through that wall, through your 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 house exterior wall, it hits the the inside of your wall, and if that wall has a vapor barrier, let's say vinyl wallpaper is a vapor barrier in other words it doesn't let water go through and we do not recommend using any vapor barriers uh, on inside walls in ohio or northern climate zones vapor barriers are a bad idea wallpaper vinyl wallpaper is a bad idea and now the vapor pressure is pushing vapor through the wall and all of a sudden it hits the vinyl wallpaper and it can't get through and so if the air conditioner is on, now the house is colder, a dew point forms. And so the mold grows behind the wallpaper. And that's why when you rip the wallpaper down, a lot of times you'll see mold, especially vinyl. And what's interesting, this particular photo came from a Marriott Dayton about 10, 15 years ago. We were sitting in a seminar uh, with uh, Building Science Corp of America, and they were teaching us about vapor barriers. And they said, you shouldn't have vapor barriers because this can happen. And I pretty much got up and ran in my hotel room right in the middle of the class and I happened to have my camera and I did take a picture of this. I then went back and put it on my computer. And what was funny was back then I had a computer for all my notes. I, took, I have a lot of continuing education classes I take. All the guys came running up to me while Dr. Jones Burke was teaching this class. And they all looked at it and they all ran to their rooms and started ripping down their wallpaper and taking pictures. And before you know it, nobody paid for hotel rooms because it was black mold infested. Um, we were never invited back to this particular Marriott. Uh, the next photo will show you the same kind of condition. We talked about brick, absorbs water. Here's the sun, the sun's hitting it. It just got rained. There's a high rise building on the Gold Coast, which is the uh, west side of Cleveland. And somebody on the sixth story was complaining about odors. And sure enough, we went across the street, took a photo right after rain, the sun was out. You can see the heated brick, that's moisture in the brick, and it's causing vapor diffusion. And she also had vinyl wallpaper. And what she was uh, smelling was the vinyl wallpaper, the odor, and the mildew. Um, now other interior house problems uh, can, can cause problems uh, such as condensation, mold, rot deterioration, wood destroying insects, odors. So dew point temperature, you know, once once you reach dew point temperature, condensation occurs and all these things can happen. It's kind of like holding your lemonade glass, you know, on a hot summer, humid day and, and water starts dripping off the glass. It's the kind of same thing. This could be happening inside your walls. It could be happening inside cavities. And once it gets wet, then it rots. And once it rots, you can also get wood boring insects and you get odors. Now, some builders came up with this brilliant idea and we have a lot of this. Thousands of homes have this design. They decided to put plastic Visqueen 6 mil poly on the inside of homes, which would be behind the, behind the um, drywall. And they called it an air barrier because they're trying to make the house tighter, you know. And some of these builders didn't use Tyvek and they think Tyvek was an air, air barrier, but Tyvek really is a drainage plane. You know, it's supposed to drain the rain. Well, they put the stuff on on the insides of homes and, and of course, um, a lot of these homes uh, have air conditioning going on and on hot humid days you could get deterioration now it doesn't happen all the time but it happens enough a lot of these houses are only like 10 to 20 years old there's full developments of this stuff these designs and a lot of these homes have carpet ramp problems they can't figure out where the ants are at and they're inside the walls and so water gets trapped in there because of the plastic it's an interior vapor barrier the moisture is coming from the outside now remember this outside humidity at a hot humid day going in and when the air conditioner is on it's cool on the inside and all of a sudden it forms condensation uh, on the inside and drips down and you can see in this photo where the entire band joist and or uh, 
the, the sill plate and uh, the bottom wall plates are deteriorated. Uh, another thing that happens is when you have a uh, high indoor humidity, you get um, uh, vapor diffusion and vapor moisture movement up into the unconditioned attic space. We talked about the attic mold a few minutes ago, and I did make a comment how it could cause roof damage. And here, here, here's a house with roof damage. A lot of times you could actually predict this problem simply by going out in front of the house or the back of the house, and you could see where the sheeting has moved and, and the roof shingles have been lifted up. And sometimes you have a lot of those unhappy faces, uh, curling, cupping uh, on the roof, and that could be a nail pushing up. So when the, when the sheeting gets wet, it expands. When it gets hot, it shrinks and pushes nails up. Also moves the, the sheeting, and now you've got wind-driven rain problems. So now the wind's going to blow water underneath. Um, sometimes this is uh, 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 it doesn't turn to water in the attic. It turns directly to ice. And these are a couple of gauges I use, and this is dew point temperature forming in the attic. And with my with my uh, uh, humidity gauge, you can see that the um, the dew point temperature is 36 degrees. That's where water forms out of the air uh, on a surface. But if you look at the thermal gauge, it's telling you that the surface is 16.2 degrees. So instead of forming water, it turned to ice. So you've got these little ice crystals on all the nail heads. And then another thing you do is when you're in your attic, you can look on the floor, and if you see little black spots, that's telling you that, that this has happened to you, and you, you've you had this problem, And because when the ice melts off the nail heads, it gets rusty, right? And it drips down, and you got these little black spots. So this is an indication telling you, hey, i got to figure out where my moisture's coming from. i got to stop the moisture generators. So other causes of moisture intrusion is good. We're going to talk about HVAC equipment, ventless appliances, foundation, siding, windows, doors, plumbing leaks, roofs, gutters, downspouts, interior coverings, and we're going to keep talking about people uh, that can cause these problems in the home. So HVAC as a moisture uh, condition could also be caused by poor balance, a poorly designed uh, HVAC system, flu spillage, condensation leaks you know from the air conditioner or inside the unit supply duct leakage in unconditioned space in other words you've got duct work it uh, supply duct work in the attic or in the crawl space and and it's not sealed okay supply or return duct leakage we talked a little bit about that and now that could also be problems underneath slabs too not just in basements and in crawl spaces uh, and then um, Water uh, in supply or return ducts under slabs. Sometimes water gets underneath your house and it causes a whole, a whole lot of problems. We're going to call this uh, Mr. Squirrel Study Case. And this was uh, an HVAC problem uh, caused by a poor balance. Uh, and what they did here is a lot of these contractors want to bring in makeup air. There's nothing wrong with that as long as you calculate it out and you, and you condition and heat and cool and dehumidify this air you're bringing in from the outside. Well, this one was just, they just hooked a, a hole up to the outside. Like, we'll just suck air into the house, you know, and bring in makeup air. And it'll be nice, fresh air. Well, it rusted, and Mr. Squirrel found it, and he loved his little tunnels. He was running around, and uh, the people did hear weird noise, and they thought they were dampers and expansion and contraction. And they had a basement, and they had a crawl space. So this cold air return kind of went through the basement, and it went in a crawl space. And in a crawl space, um, which had it was a vented crawl space and you don't want vented crawl spaces in this design uh, climate cold climate design area where, where we live up in northern america um, that was an old way of doing it the problem with vented crawl spaces is that in the summer you get hot and humid air and that could cause condensation and mold and in the winter you get cold air which causes cold floors you get any condensation and and it, and then if you've got any duct work, you could have duct leakage from the supply end. If you've got returns, you could have you're sucking in air from the outside, and you're just wasting money. So just a bad idea. You want to heat, cool, condition, dehumidify. You want to treat your crawl space like your living room. And you can get on the internet. And you can look up how to do it. It's called the condition crawl space. Well, this particular one was a vented crawl space, and it had cold air returns going through it. So, of course, there's holes in it. It's not sealed. We talked about that. And the plumbers make their holes, and the carpenters make their holes. Well, the squirrel found the big hole. And so he jumped down and said, oh, look at my new playground. And he ran around a little crawl space until he got tired. And then he wanted to get back in the ductwork, and he couldn't jump up into that ductwork. And he was kind of stuck in there, and it was a one-way trip. And when I was down in this crawl space, 
um, I found the dead mummy squirrel. Matter of fact, there's like five or six of them. And I, I wonder if these people noticed that they kept losing squirrels. Um, but anyways, this is a poor design, um, poor HVAC design. And so basically the return duct permitted non-conditioner to enter. The return air duct leakage uh, occurred in non-conditioned space, uh, which permitted hot, humid air to enter during the summer and cold air to enter in the winter. And then because of all this extra air we're bringing in, we had super positive air in the upper floors and they had major ice problems too. And, uh, and they had them at the thermal bypass conditions, which would have been their pull down air, uh, I'm sorry, their pull down stair system that they had. Well, anyways, they fixed it and you know, they did okay. It's, you know, they, 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 they sealed up the vent to the outside with an interior grill, which is gonna rust. Um, and they closed it, but that's not really the right way of fixing it, but it'll work temporarily and they did install a vapor barrier on the dirt floor and they did insulate the walls and they did seal that dirt floor and they did seal up the cold air returns and they heated it, cooled it and conditioned it. So they, so they corrected uh, their problem. Now, HVAC can cause other problems like your, your, your flus uh, could spill. Now you have draft. Draft is like the, the, the combustion uh, exhaust fumes that go up to the chimney up you know that you exhaust out of your home and you have, it's got to be able to be pulled up and that's called draft and you want to be a draft a good draft is 0.01 to 0.02 but if you've got no draft in other words you know there's a problem with your chimney and it's spilling well the com the byproduct of of combustion is moisture and carbon dioxide and probably carbon monoxide right well you could tell by looking at it there's always rust on that top portion of the furnace and then if there's rust at the burners well that means you know that means you could have too much draft way too much there's like fans on and things like that and it's just sucking air out of your house and so the furnace and also water heater can't compete with it so now you have incomplete combustion this is the worst type so it can't make it up the chimney and it goes back into the burners and you have incomplete combustion and that's how you get carbon monoxide and uh it's a problem um so basically low draft is a problem and high draft and they both can, can, can cause carbon dioxide. So you wanna be looking for these rust stains. Um, sometimes you can just feel it with your hand and put your hand there. You, can, you know, it can be really hot. You could burn yourself with that or you could use a draft gauge or you could hire your HVAC guy to do it for you. Um, that's a draft gauge, those are about 30 bucks. I don't expect you to learn how to use one of those. You have to drill a hole and all that, but uh, they're not expensive. Um, things that can cause poor draft, dryer operation, furnace blower operations if you got big exhaust fans in the kitchen huge house fans those fans in the attic we talked about earlier if you got a lot of fireplaces the dampers are open you're going to have the natural uh, draft that's going to just suck air right out of your house opening and closing windows weather conditions windy days sometimes those trees keep growing and growing and now they create eddy currents on your roof so now you have you have problems with with drafting your chimneys chimneys could be poorly designed too short too long and then of course you could have flu restrictions you could have animals in them um, there's particular nest actually uh, was a tragic uh, condition because it, it killed a 30 year old girl in the Columbus area uh, the, the flu in the, the furnace was restricted and that caused uh, uh, incomplete combustion of the furnace and the water heater because they shared this flu um, you could have defective furnace vents. These black vents, these transparent vents are defective. They leak, and if they're in walls, they could drip water in your walls, and now you're gonna have mold growing in there, you're gonna have carpenter ants, so you wanna check your, your uh, vents. And then in the old days, they put up these, these metal spring activated vents, and I, I'm not sure I have, a, I have a problem with these because they don't communicate with the furnace, so if they get rusted, they stay closed, you're gonna have a problem. And then this particular one was actually rusted, had a dead bird in it, the skeleton, the skeleton remains of a bird, uh, and it was causing the water heater to spill, and the people in this house were getting sick because when it's, whenever you see stains on a bottom water heater like that, you have incomplete combustion, you get a chance of high carbon monoxide. Uh, Ventless heaters, you know, these there's, these things produce, as we talked earlier, they produce water, vapor, and carbon dioxide. And here's a heater in a garage. People like to heat their garages, or they want to add these in their basements or their third floors. Well, it kind of sits on a window, and here's a brand new window that they uh, uh, changed, and it's rotted out. The whole window's rotted out. Um, dryer vents. If you've got leaking dryer vents, they're too long, they're crimped. You know, you share them like this photo here is showing you a shared dryer vent with a basement fan. You can't do that. Um, you're going to have longer drying times. 
Uh, you're going to have uh, blockages. You're going to have high indoor humidity. H here's a dryer vent that's been covered up from mulch on the exterior. Well, that's not going to work. These people had condensation within the wall, and they had rotting, deterioration, uh, and mold. And here's a contraption where I guess somebody came up with this idea and says, hey, run a dryer vent through, uh, uh, let's say, the garage, and you will filter the air and, and will heat the garage. But the garage started having mold in it because you had humidity and the garage is cold. So there's mold on the garage door, mold on all the walls. You don't want humid air going into a non-conditioned space. And, of course, pantyhose. Uh, you see these a lot. Um, you know, don't recycle your pantyhose onto a dryer vent. Um, we also don't recommend plastic dryer vents like you saw in that photo. If you have too many bends or crimps in them, it restricts. Now nah, we got a whole new problem. Now we got lint in there. And if it's a gas dryer, the vent is the combustion fumes leaving, and you could create a fire. Um, and, you know, every, every depending on the size of your dryer load, could be one to two gallons. So, you know, think about this. If you keep one load a day, there's two gallons of water you're putting into it, depending on your house and your insulation. We talked about the the storage capacity of your house after a while you're going to have problems and in this particular next photo you'll see what um, this one here they had the garbage man uh, squished it and then in the crawl space it blew apart and the crawl space was full of lint and that's an indoor air particulate quality problem as well not to mention you've got mold growing uh, in the crawl space the crawl space is cold the vents leaking in there and nobody goes and checks it out and you start wondering why you've got carpet ramps and other problems in the home Sometimes they move dryer vents to the center of the house on the second floor and they put these 50 foot long lines. Well, those aren't going to work. They're going to get plugged up and it's going to take you an hour to dry your jeans. Basically, your dryer vent, you don't want it to be more than 25 feet long, but then you got to subtract 5 feet for every 90 degree bend and another 2.5 feet for every 45. And that's where you want to be at, okay? And, and so you want to stay in that range to have a good dryer vent. Now, if there's a hole in your dryer vent, or you're over drying and your dryer vents plugged up uh, then you're going to create moisture problems in your house so now the moisture has to leave remember we talked about high vapor pressure so now we're going to diffuse we're going to go the opposite before we were going remember the sun was was heating up the wet brick and it was hitting the plastic well guess what the outside of your house if it's a wood house and it's painted especially an old lakewood house that's got 50 coats of paint on it it's almost like a vapor barrier so the more coats of paint you put on your wood house especially a house that's 90 100 years old it almost becomes a vapor barrier because the moisture can't get through like eight coats of paint either. So now the dryer vent's causing high vapor pressure in the house and is diffusing through the house, hits the paint and it can't get out. So it condensates because it's cold outside. Remember the air conditioner was inside in the summer. Now we're in the winter and it's cold outside. And so it forms a dew point on the on the paint and the paint starts to bubble and you, you go up and poke these things and water comes out of them. And so you wonder why you have a lot more paint failure on older homes especially that have been painted many, many times. And the house are getting, um, we're insulating them more, and so now we're getting more and more paint filler. Plus you have to remember this paint is probably lead paint. So it's a whole nother environmental uh, problem. You wanna make sure that your bathroom's exhaust to the roof. Um, now here it looks like they do, but when you're outside, you don't see the pipes going through. And these people had problems in the home as well. And it took a while to figure this one out because we had no clue that they forgot to drill the holes through the roof. And so the humidity and moisture was just going right back into the house. Sub pumps, you know what, we always hear about the sub pumps. You know, if you got a sub pump and it's very active, you better have a battery backup. You better have a secondary sub pump. You better have a water pump. You better figure something out, you know, especially if your house is built too low and you're, you know, higher, your foundation is, is uh, lower than a water table or you have other, other uh, water uh, conditions on the exterior so sub pumps fail when they fail they cause mold and then you have to call your insurance company now you have to have special insurance for sub pumps um, some of the biggest moisture generators that we run into are humidifiers humidifiers people put these things on they don't even need them half the time and they cause mold in their attics uh, foundation leaks can be caused by a lot of different conditions and one of the number one is going to be roots the, the trees grow, the trees are too close to the house, they're in front of the house, the roots plug up the drain tiles and the storm lines. And then once they do that, they don't drain and you get hydrostatic pressure up against your foundation and you get leaks. Uh, sometimes roots get into the sewers and that's when your sewers back up and you get floods. 
Uh, foundation grading. If your water, if your ground isn't properly sloped, then water is going to run towards your house. And most foundations have cracks. You have shrinkage cracks. You have differential settlement cracks. Whatever. If it's a concrete system, it's going to have shrinkage cracks because all concrete foundations crack. So now you got water leaking in the cracks, and uh, and water leaking in. Uh, in, in cracks depend they could be hidden in the wall. So now you've got mold growing behind your basement drywall, right? So you want to correct any exterior uh, Grading issue and you want to manage all your exterior water runoff um, Sometimes you don't know where the leaks coming from and foundations if you have masonry block walls um, and terracotta tile uh, Sometimes they're hollow so the water kind of travels so you may have a leak outside you know from a crack or, or from a leaking gutter but then the basement's leaking somewhere else so it kind of like travels in a v pattern and it fills up because water goes into the block and then it leaks out at the bottom whereas concrete a lot of times it leaks right at that crack and so it usually reinforced concrete leaks are easier to fix um, i probably wouldn't call a, a waterproofer for this i would call a epoxy injection contractor here you see the gutter is dripping leaking here you see a shrinkage crack it's leaking the waterproofer says 15 grand it's not it could simply be an epoxy injection repair there are companies that do this 600 bucks okay um, now sometimes the hydrostatic pressure uh, is so is so intense that it causes cracks and failures this here is a shear crack where the whole bottom of the foundation shears. Now you're going to definitely have leaks because if the cracks on the inside, the cracks on the outside, and caulking doesn't repair this. And so you, you're going to not only have to do a water management, you're going to have to do water uh, damp proofing, waterproofing, some type of waterproofing repair, and you're going to have to do a structural repair. Sometimes cracks are hidden in crawl spaces where you have a basement and a crawl space, and you gotta think about it, the basement was dug out first, it filled in the basement, and then he put the crawl space in, right? So a lot of times that soil was backfilled, it wasn't compacted, so you get this, and that's what happened here, it settles. Um, and because the soil for the original foundation uh, wasn't compacted. Well, anyways, you gotta go in your crawl space, it's gonna leak, all right, and you gotta make repairs. Sometimes you have finished basement walls, you can't see the cracks, but you know what? If you see two vertical cracks on the outside walls within a foot on the ends, generally those are caused by hydrostatic pressure. In other words, the wall is getting pushed in. That's why they're cracked on the outside. So if you go downstairs, in this particular case, sometimes people let me cut holes in their walls. There's my crack, and I know the crack could be leaking, and if it's leaking, you know, this could have been a mold complaint or an odor complaint because that gets trapped behind that drywall. So then now we got horizontal cracks, we got shearing, we're gonna fix them, right? Well, these are okay, unfortunately. They do nothing for shear. In other words, the bottom could still shear and it will, now the whole wall can tip, but it does fix the horizontal crack. Um, a, lot of, a lot of waterproofers are putting these on because they're rather easy. And then you got the plate people, and these are good too. Unfortunately, sometimes the crack just moves to uh, the upper course and lower course, but these companies generally will give you warranty, so they'll just come back and put another one of these in, and they're like about 600 bucks a piece. And then some people try to make their own, and you can see on this wall, that's not working. Uh, the best of these I-beam vertical supports that engineers put in, and I'm not sure you have to be an engineer to put these in, but these generally work the best. Now, they don't do anything for water, but they do keep the walls from moving. We talked a little bit about crawl spaces. If your vent is too low to the ground, well, water's gonna leak in the vent, and you're gonna flood your crawl space, and if you don't go in your crawl space, you're not gonna know what's going on down there. Uh, if your vapor barrier is done wrong, like here you can see mud on top, mud on the bottom, it, this crawl space is just bad, and, and this house stunk, and the house is gonna rot. Uh, you can't have puddles of water underneath your house. Sometimes you don't see them until you dig and you find out later that they put the stone on top of the vapor barrier. Well, that's not going to work because once the water gets in there, it's going to stick there. And now, now you're, the stone is like a swimming pool and the water is slowly evaporating into the home. Um, sometimes you walk into a door. You know, my, my big thing is when I walk in a door, I can smell the first whiff, whether it's a pet problem, a urine problem, an odor problem, a stone problem, a mold problem, a water problem. You can smell right at the door, and, and then you kind of lose it because you get used to it. Well, this particular house, she was actually getting sick. The house stunk, and she had poor grading. We talked about that. You got to drain the rain. Um, and, and so we went into her furnace and she had ductwork underneath the slab. Now, a lot of our homes and these older homes don't have this, but some of the additions, they'll, they'll have slabs and run the ducts underneath the additions. Well, you know what? The ductwork's gotta be sealed, it's gotta be done right because 
uh, if it looks like this one, and we, we cut a hole in here to look inside with our cameras, and you can see it completely deteriorated. All the ducts just get flooded every time it rains. Sometimes you can just go into a, a heat register and pop the register and look inside. And I like to just stick my hand down in. And you can see just from the flood marks, this thing has been flooding every spring. And they probably have mold problems, you know, on the corners, the northeast corners. You know, they're washing it away. And, and they may have odors in the spring. Well, you, you got to figure out what's going on. And sometimes this could be a very expensive repair. Other times we'll have moisture conditions and musty odors. You walk in that front door. Now, now, I'm not sure we have too many of these designs in Lakewood. But there's a ton of these uh, on West Lake, on the west side. And these are, these are I call them column supports, front entrance column supports. Well, what is underneath them? There's a foundation underneath them, and a lot of times it's not in the basement. It could just be a, a hidden hollow cavity. And, and now if it's brick or stone, it gets wet, right? And we talked about no weep poles. The water goes down into there, and it's cold. And so it's not a heated space. So now in the basement, which is a heated space, you lose some of that, that uh, humidity because this is usually the humidity in your house and it forms a dew point underneath these places. And this is a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of these homes have carpet rat issues and you get these odors. So once you get up in the basement, you can take the drop ceiling down, rope the ceiling up, remove the insulation. Then you gotta kind of stick your head up in there if it could fit or you gotta use a camera and reach over. And sometimes you actually see cavities. Um, these cavities are in the older homes uh, on these actually these were uh, cavities um, under front kickouts some of the Lakewood homes have those those octagon kickouts and they have cavities underneath them and nobody knows where they're at and it could be moisture down in there and that could be you know a source of moisture and a source of odor um, and you really can't do anything unless you have a camera maybe you could put a camera on a stick you know sometimes you could stick your hand in there you know you might want to use a strap that way you don't drop your camera because it'll be hard to get that particular picture also caused we got called in for this house because of the odors and it caused corrosion of all the pipes as they couldn't figure out why there were water stains uh, and droplet stains on all the metal in the basement it's because the this uh, this column cavity kickout was a a moisture uh, generator a lot of homes have these gaps underneath their slabs and if you've got a house with a slab um you know sometimes you're lucky you could feel it it's hollow but builders generally don't compact the soil underneath the slabs they dig the house they dig the footers they disturb the soil underneath the slab and they never compact it so then after a while it kind of settles and the concrete stays in, a, in in one place now if they didn't put plastic underneath the concrete well that could absorb a little bit and here you can see what's happening is the air conditioner's not in the house the concrete's cool it's forming a dew point but the real problem is that it also had ductwork going through here and it was communicating with this space so it was picking up moisture from underneath the slab and then these are just ducts underneath the slabs they settle i've just got a couple pictures one was crushed when they pour the concrete, the guy stepped on it. No idea how you got a two by four in one, but probably during construction. And then you can see the water uh, in, in, in the one. And the other one on the far right, you can see how the whole thing dropped. And now you've got communication with all the dirt and soil. So now you've got the soil gases and radon and odors. Doors, doors and windows leak. Okay, there's a lot of bad windows uh, that we're having problems with and we're not gonna get into that in this one, but the Pella Pro lines, those aluminum clad windows, you better check those. Uh, those can rot out very quickly. Uh, the class action lawsuits are done with, and so those are starting to rot out at 10 to 12 years. Uh, doors uh, also have problems, especially if they don't have overhangs, um, if they're facing the south. The P's doors had problems, so you find out you lift up the carpets and there's rot deterioration underneath them. Uh, sometimes you have odors and carpet rant issues. You want to get up underneath them. You want to move the, the uh, drop ceilings and check. And when you move the drop ceilings and check, you'll see these band joists, pockets, a lot of times they're stained. And here you can see the screwdrivers going right through it. That's a moisture meter. I'm showing the people how they're leaking. Sometimes they're so rotted, the door uh, sill plate and band joists, because they leak, that it goes right through it. And then you can get underneath the stairs because that's settled too. And so now you got these big cavities underneath the stairs. So I don't know, may not be a good idea to use those steps to bring in your refrigerator on the dolly. Okay, maybe we could have a collapse or a crack. Well, we'll talk about roof leaks next. You know, flat roofs leak. 
Um, they can leak from all types of reason: granulation, ballooning when the wind blows. If the if the old roof was wet, they put the new roof on top. You can see how the plants are growing through it. Um, and so, basically, there's two types of roofs. I believe the ones that leak and the ones that are going to leak. That's actually a picture of me in my 20s. I used to rent the, the Penfield house. I rented this Franklin Wright house for six years during my college days. I always had roof leaks, chimney fires, and uh, it was a glass house, single pane glass. Very expensive to live there. Uh, improper roof pitches. You know, the lower the pitch, you got to have the right roof. I see like two 12 pitch roofs and they have shingles on. You should be using rolled roofs. And, and so, uh, lower pitch roofs, you want to be careful with. They can leak, especially uh, if you have the wrong type of material. Old roofs, bad roofs, clay tiles that are cracked, you know, roofs that have severe uh, cracking from granulation, uh, nails popping, and you know, nails could pop from ice dams, they could pop from humidity. Um, and then flashing around chimneys, you know, if the nails uh, are holes. A lot of times people have chimney leaks and they think it's the flashing and it's really the chimney. A lot of times the chimney absorbs water and just like we talked about in those earlier uh, solar vapor diffusion examples, well, if the, if the chimney brick gets wet, well, it's going to run down the chimney and leak inside. So you could flash it all you want, but the upper chimney's leaking. So maybe you got to paint the chimney, or maybe you have to try to seal it. I'm not a big guy on sealing. Um, and here you can see where they try to seal it and flash it, but that wasn't the problem. The infrared's actually showing you the water leaking in the brick into the, into the attic space. Sometimes it leaks from the top down, and you can see chimneys. Brick are hollow, right? They got those holes in them. Well, if you got holes in them, water's going to go down into them and leak into the, into the, uh, uh, into the brickwork. Gutters. Um, you know what? You have all types of gutter contraction. Gutters have to be cleaned probably before winter and after winter depending on if you're living in an area with a lot of trees and if you got those screens you know that's nice but sometimes the screens cause problems now here's uh, one of these contraptions that probably cost you three grand to put in you know the water drains into the little holes the leaves get pushed off the ledge and the water surface tension permits water to drain into the gutter that's really way too complicated i'm going to show you how this really works okay <laughs> it doesn't and so it does get rid of leaves, but it doesn't do anything for ice dams. And a lot of times it overflows. And even when it overflows, the ground gets wet. When the ground gets wet, you get hydrostatic pressure. When you get hydrostatic pressure, you get leaks and cracks. And so by being lazy, having your gutters clean, uh, not, you know, not having them clean, but having one of these contraptions put on them, uh, you could be causing a whole new set of problems. By the way, you could probably have your gutters clean from the neighborhood gutter cleaning guy that comes by and does like, you know, for 50 bucks, he does the whole street. There's always some guy, you know, doing gutters. And for that money, you can have those gutters clean for 10 years. Plus, you could type just problems with the roof or the chimney and the antenna's dent, uh, dented or missing. Whatever. He's up there cleaning. If he sees something, he's going to tell you. So I think cleaning gutters is a better idea than trying to use these contraptions. Then they sell these crazy contraptions. This one here is called the gutter sponge. Well, the gutter sponge people forgot one thing, that the shingles were granulate, the granulates fill the gutters, and then the moss grows on and then it overflows anyways. And this guy called me up for a mold inspection and he spent three grand or two grand on these gutter contraptions and he didn't realize that's what was causing it. There's the gutter. And then you got the people who put the gutter contraption in and use the ice cables. It's like, wait a minute, why don't you clean your gutters? Maybe you should fix your thermal bypass. Maybe you should fix your water problem. So you know what? There's some common sense here. And I call this ridiculousness. And this will conclude my one hour inspection or my one hour class. Um, I do have uh, other classes that are much longer and more detailed uh, on my website and on the internet. 